Well, welcome everyone to uh, Thornhill Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here. So glad that you're able to worship with us today. We are continuing our series through the book of Ephesians with our reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Before we get started, though, I just wanted just to say congratulations and welcome to Eshel Del Rosario and Lyndon Cron, who have been voted in by the church membership to join our elders team uh, earlier this month. And, and so just really excited to have them as part of our ministry team. Uh, all the current elders were also affirmed in their role and just really excited about what God is going to do in this next season of ministry here at Thornhill. So, uh, so just very excited for those that, that attended and for the life of the church here um, moving forward. This is Paul's words from Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of, of Christ and God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful to be, able to, to be able to worship you. We thank you that you give us a, a model of what love looks like. We pray that as we continue to study your word, that we will continue to, to, discover what, the, the, to discover what love looks like, Jesus. And, and Lord, as we contrast what the, the world's love is defined by with what you uh, model for us, help us to walk in that, Jesus. Would you, would you continue to reveal uh, yourself to us as, as we continue to discover more of your truth through your word today. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, many of you may remember the song Tainted Love, uh, popularized by the, the British band Soft Cell. It came out in the early 80s. For those of you that are younger, you, may, uh, might, you might know a darker version sung by Marilyn Manson. The song, though, is about the tension of relationships and love, where it seems like you never get back as much as you put in. The song is about how you give all of yourself, all of your personhood. You pour out so much love, but in the end, it's just not reciprocated. And now the people who are singing these songs are, are experiencing the feeling of this emptiness, of this tainted love. And all they can do now is hope to run away from it. Yet they keep getting drawn back to this tainted relationship. What many people don't know is that this song was actually written and recorded almost two decades before Soft Cell sung it. It was written by a man named Ed Cobb and sung by Gloria Jones in the early 60s. I find it interesting that, that although this song was first recorded in the 60s and then re-recorded in the early 80s and then re-recorded -re 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 in the two, early 2000s, that this song still has staying power. That it's more than just a catchy beat, but its lyrics reflect something that many people can relate to. Where we observe and experience different degrees of tainted love, don't we? Divorce rates are as high in the church as they are outside the church. Pornography is flourishing on websites and is being felt in mainstream media everywhere. In fact, just this morning I was reading about a, about a potential new Netflix series that is going to record just outside of Sundry. And the creators of this project said this line, which I think captures this point. It's going to have lots of drama, lots of drugs, sex, everything else that the TV needs and entertains people. And sex has now become this brand of entertainment like Nintendo and PlayStation. Movies and TV rating systems have changed over the years, and what was once rated R is now maybe PG. What was once considered rated X is now much more visible and acceptable today. I mean, you name the most outrageous sexual expression and it's likely been tried and likely been validated somewhere. Love seems to be whatever people define it as. And it, all, it often feels like it's a moving target at times. Culturally, our world would define love as tolerance and acceptance. Seems admirable. The Bible actually tells us what love is too as a selfless expression of servanthood and humility towards those around us. Let me say that again. The selfless expression of servanthood and humility 
towards those around us. But in the Bible, through Jesus, we see servanthood and humility and selflessness personified. We see love in the flesh. Unfortunately, us, as the broken people we are, take this example of love and we do what we do and we mess it up. Where sometimes we make our relationships conditional. If you do this, then I will show you love. And it feels like we need to earn the love that someone else might give to us. If you jump through these hoops, then you will have done enough to earn my love. If you feel good, if you make me feel good, then I'll make you feel good. Paul, though, is addressing that type of tainted love, where the religious and paganistic practices of the day lent themselves to this type of transactional love, where the paganistic rituals required certain acts, and if they were performed, you would satisfy the goddess Artemis. And it's this type of transactional, tainted love that Paul is addressing here in verses 3 and 4, when he says, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you. Now, the Greek words that Paul uses here for sexual immorality, which is what he's talking about here, is the Greek word porneia, which is where we get the root word for pornography from. It's this picture of unhealthy, broken, tainted picture of sexuality. The other word that Paul uses for impurity just furthers Paul's point here of the importance of being physically and sexually pure. Unfortunately, in Ephesus, sex was viewed as a tool for self-gratification rather than an expression of deep relational and emotional intimacy. And these sexual practices tainted the God-given directive that sex was intended as a physical expression of love towards a spouse. The degree to which the sexual practices went in Ephesus, though, were so vast and perverse that Paul says, don't even give them names. We don't want to go down that path. I think what Paul is doing here is he's showing us his understanding of sexual sin. About seven years ago, my my parents, they live in southeast Calgary in Lake Midnapore, and and they they invited my family and my brother and his family to join them for Christmas. And, and so one day, we, it was a beautiful winter day, and, and we decided, you know what, my brother and I, we're going to go, and we're going to go for a round of disc golf. And right across the street, there's a little nine-hole disc, nine disc golf course right, beside, right across the street. And, and, uh, and so we, we decided we'd do a quick round, and it was fine. But right, on this part of the, right, be, right beside the disc golf course is a really, really huge hill where kids will often toboggan. And I suggested to my brother, why don't we go to the top of the hill and just see how far we can throw the discs? And we, tried, we threw a couple discs, and that was fine. And then, and then I had another brilliant idea. I said, why don't we see how fast we can go? Why don't we see, I, wonder, I wonder what it would be like if we could ride one of these things. And so if you've ever seen National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, where, they, where they're on the, the, giant, the giant metal saucer, that's the kind of idea that's going on here where we sat down on, this, on, the, on these discs that are only about eight inches in diameter and tried to balance ourselves the top of the hill. Now, what I didn't really consider was that uh, as the sun was shining and beating down on the side of this hill, <clears throat> that, that, the, that the sun was beginning to melt the side of the hill and, and it was creating this icy sheen on it. And it was basically like a skating rink on a slope. And so as, as my brother and I began to balance ourselves on these small little discs, trying to figure out how to, how to balance ourselves, we started to, started to move, and, we start, and I started to slide down the hill. At that point, I hadn't really taken into, into account what sort of velocity that, that we would be moving at. It was fast. It was very fast. I also, in my haste, hadn't considered how I was going to stop or let alone slow down. And so instinctually, as I was whipping down this hill, I, I jabbed my heels into the snow. Well, all that accomplished was lots of snow on my face, and I began, to, I began to spin. And suddenly now, I was going at about Mach 10 in circles, whipping by and seeing people's horrified faces in a blur as they watched this man accelerate down this hill. And I felt like this, total, this, this human centrifuge as I was just circling, just spinning out of control down the hill. But I think that's the point that Paul is making here when he's saying, don't even name these sexual sins. Don't even name these sexual activities. See, Paul understood that when the mind starts to follow this path, especially in the realm of sexual activity, that our minds can gather momentum really quickly. 
that it doesn't take long at all for them to start to spin out of control. So instead, Paul says, don't even sit on that disc. Don't even start, don't even start going down this hill. Just avoid it altogether. That's a dumb idea. Because, that's, because here's one of the many problems with sexual sin, is that it actually creates a physiological event in our brains as we experience it in Ephesus, because their entire pagan worship experience was surrounding sex and temple prostitution, they had developed this really unhealthy understanding of sex. The Ephesians were already spinning wildly out of control. So why is this important? When we feed our brains healthy information, it allows us to interact with each other in healthy and appropriate ways. When we feed our brains healthy information, it allows, us, it allows our brain to interact in healthy and appropriate ways. Clinical psychologist Dan Siegel, he uses a simple illustration that I think helps us to illustrate the importance of learning how to control what we feed our brain. So if you can, just hold up one hand. It doesn't matter which hand it is. Just hold up one hand. And as you do that, just tuck your thumb into the palm of your hand and then close the four fingers over your thumb. And what you've just done is you've created a smaller illustration of your brain. The spinal cord here represents your wrist. The thumb is the brain stem in the limbic area. This area here helps to regulate our emotions and how we respond to emotional stimulus. The higher part of our brain, our fingers, our four fingers, is the cortex. It helps us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. It helps to regulate our morality. So again, the thumb is the emotion, four fingers are logic and reason. Now what happens is that the part of the brain directly behind our forehead, that part of the brain actually helps to regulate between the emotions and reason. And so it helps us to know how we respond and react appropriately when we are emotionally stimulated, or in this particular case, sexually aroused. What happens, though, in the context of sexual arousal, like Paul is addressing here, is that when our lower part, the emotional part of our brain, is fed and stimulated sexually, it begins to communicate to the upper part of the brain and says, I like that. Do that more. And the more frequently it happens, the stronger that desire becomes and the neurons that communicate to each other, to the lower and to the upper, they begin to get stronger as well. Until the part of the brain that regulates the emotions and morality, they actually short circuit. Now the emotion part of the brain is being fed, with, being fed so frequently with sexual stimulus that logic and reason aren't regulating emotions any longer. But instead, they're just looking for ways to feed that emotional reaction. And so the brain feeds the brain. And self-control becomes non-existent. To the point that we actually begin to program our brains because the sexual stimulus is so strong and feels so good and intense that we actually begin to crave that experience. And our logic and rational decision-making portion of the brain starts to do whatever it can to justify and try to make this, try to pursue ways to feed the emotional emotional response. Paul, though, is saying that's not what sex is supposed to be. That's certainly not what love is supposed to be. That you need to stop feeding the emotional part of the brain and reframe your brain, rewire the neurons in your brain. If you're starting to spin out of control like I was on the hill, just jump off. You might get a little bit of road rash on the landing, but it'll be far less painful than if, than if you would get to, the, get to the bottom of this slippery slope. And even if your mind starts to go on this downward trajectory, just, just abandon ship, just get out of there. Paul says the best way to start is to not even talk about it. Now, that doesn't mean that we keep it a secret, especially for those of us that, that maybe it's, we need help. We, have, we, need, we need assistance in trying to help us to get off the, the disc. We just don't know how to. We don't have the strength to do it. Paul says, though, that the best place to start is just to don't get on that disc. Don't put yourself in a situation where you might start to slide down. For all of us, our brains are programmed and wired to respond to sexual stimulus. For the Ephesians, a large portion of their culture was stimulated by an unhealthy view of sex and relationships. I also want to mention two things. First thing is this, that a lot of people culturally, I think, think this is a male issue, male-dominated issue. It is not. Statistics show us that this is male and female issue. Second thing I want to point out is, is this, 
that Paul is not saying that sex is bad or a sin. Because it's not. It's actually a gift that God gave us. It's actually a gift that, that is meant to be practiced within certain parameters for us to experience it. Specifically to a married man and woman in a monogamous marriage relationship. Paul, though, in Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the, redoing, by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There might be times that we need to reframe our brains, that we, mean, we may need some literal, trans, literal transformation to occur in how we think and see and experience the world and ourselves. That may include the way we perceive sex, the way we perceive relationships. Some of those things may need to be restructured and reframed. Fortunately, Paul tells us in verse 1 how to do that. And he says, be an imitator of God. And that word imitate simply means to take or follow someone as a model. Or to copy a person's speech or mannerisms. The way a child might imitate their parents. Or a parrot imitates its owner where our lives are a reflection of who Jesus is. For the Ephesians, Paul is saying, don't look at the cultic practices of Artemis and reflect those things. That's not a good path to go down. Don't look at Netflix. Don't look at pop icons. If you want to see what real living looks like, live like Jesus. If you want to see what real love looks like, live like Jesus. If we try to imitate other people, there may be some worthy people in each of our lives to try to emulate. But ultimately, everyone has their shortcomings and limitations, except one. Jesus doesn't. Occasionally, I'll have conversations with people who have been hurt by the church, who have been disappointed or are angry because of the hypocrisy they see, and I have to remind them, and I have to remind myself at times as well, don't look at people as the, as the standard. We're messed up. We're broken. We're full of shortcomings. Look at Jesus instead. Even though we are created in the image of God, what happens, unfortunately, is because of those shortcomings and limitations, is that we can never fully imitate the divinity and character of God because no matter how hard we try, sin taints it. But it's in this imitation of Jesus that we begin to live out what true love is like. Now, as I said earlier, We've all got multiple, de multiple definitions of what love is. But it's in Jesus that we actually see it lived out and modeled for us so that we know how to walk in that love. Now, if you've ever gone, if you've ever gone on a hike anywhere, you know the difference between walking on a path where someone has already been on versus trying to blaze your own trail, doing your own thing. When you go by yourself, when you try to blaze your own trail, it is more difficult. You use so much more energy you don't know which way is the right way. There's often obstacles and challenges that you can't anticipate. But when we're on the path that's been created for us, it's often, full, it's often free of debris. It's usually flatter. It's an easier, less difficult path to go. And to be honest, I find that there is something incredibly reassuring knowing that others have walked this path that I'm currently on and that I'm not alone on this journey. Jesus models for us a path to walk in so that we can base our lives around that pattern of living. Paul here understood that how we think governs how we act. So we are constantly needing to be renewing, reframing our minds, walking in the path of Jesus, walk, walk, walking the path of Jesus rather than walking in our own paths alone. But Paul also understood that in order for us to walk in real, true love, we need to have an example to follow as well, where Jesus acts as our guide for us as we attempt to walk in love in its truest form. Three years ago, my, my father-in-law, he, he took me and him on a fly fishing trip in Fernie. Now, I had fished the Elk River a few times, but to be very honest, I didn't really know where the best places were to fish or the places that looked inviting that probably were just a waste of time. I didn't know which places were safe to be on and which ones were not. But fortunately, my father and I, my father-in-law and I, we had a guide, Landon. Landon had been on the river dozens of times that year alone. He had grown up on that river. 
He knew where the fishy spots were. He knew the spots that, were just, that, were, were, that looked good but weren't. He knew the spots to avoid because it was just a waste of time. He knew the spots that were safe versus unsafe. And he led us through that. Having him there as our guide really transformed our experience into one that was memorable and positive. But that's what happens when we imitate Jesus. When we use Jesus as our example to help us guide us into the ways that we live our lives. Because I think most of us know that if, I left, that if we're left to our own devices, that we'll do whatever we want. That it can lead to chaos. The reality here, though, is that we discovered earlier in Ephesians is that there are some major cultural tensions between the Jews and the Gentiles that Paul has, has called them to address by, by saying, love each other, forgive each other, do not be angry with one another. And for the most part, as we talked about, they're used to this transactional type of love. And so when, when love is not being reciprocated and, 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 and when we're interacting with people, that's just hard to love. Our immediate response, and, and theirs is, would be as well, but I don't know how to. I don't know how to love these people. I can't stand them. Paul knows this and preemptively says, if you aren't sure how to love them, look to Jesus. If you aren't sure how to love, look at the way Jesus did it. If you aren't sure how to forgive, look how Jesus did it. No, I don't know about you, but for me, there's a, there's a number of people in my life who it's really easy to love. It's easy for me to love my wife and kids, my friends and family. But eventually, at some point, each of us will cross paths with people that we need to intentionally choose to love. If you aren't sure how to serve the people who really annoy you, if you aren't sure how to love the people who really annoy you and push your buttons, look how Jesus loved his enemies. Look how Jesus models love for us. Where instead of asking the question, what can that person do for me? Or how does that person make me feel? What if love was something else entirely? What if we had a different standard to follow? What if love was actually an act of obedience? Now we discover really quickly from Jesus is that love has very little to do with how we feel around someone. What if we shift our standard about love from what we get out of it to what we put into it? What if we shift our standard about love from what we get out of it to what we put into it? Instead, love is this conscious decision we make to give towards others. Paul, though, gives us one critical way to imitate Jesus in verse 2, and then fleshes out the application for us in the next two chapters. And he says, Walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Christ gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And then Paul goes on for the rest of chapter 5 and 6 and says, this is what it looks like in the context of our relationships. If we look at Jesus as the standard for what sacrifice looks like, Jesus set the standard very, very high for us to aim for. His sacrifice becomes the guide that we use when we question whether it's worth it. When we question obedience, when we question faithfulness, he is our guide to be able to do that. In the same way that Jesus gave himself up as a sacrifice, that means that you and I are called to give ourselves up as well. Paul writes in Philippians 2 that tells us that Jesus forfeited his rights. You see, the difference between the sacrifices the Ephesians were used to seeing in the temple of Artemis compared to what Paul is talking about here is that one was rooted in love while the other was rooted in ritual. Paul says that Jesus' sacrifice was voluntary because he was motivated by love, not an expectation. Jesus' sacrifice was voluntary because he knew that if he didn't volunteer as sacrifice, then you and I would never experience the relationships that we were created to experience. Jesus knew that if he didn't volunteer as a sacrifice, then you and I would never experience the relationships we were intended to experience. Through Jesus, we discover that what real love looks like, that it requires characteristics like the ones Paul describes in verses 1 through 5, sacrifice, humility, purity, gratitude. Now this morning, today, we receive communion, 
We receive it as a reminder that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for us. That it was his sacrifice that revealed the purest expression of love to humanity. It's his sacrifice that provides the guide for us to follow. It's this love that, that shows us an alternative to the tainted love that the world has to offer. Today, as we receive communion, we use this as a time to examine our own lives. We use it as a space for us to help refine us so that we can imitate Jesus more and more. Communion is, is one of those times where we create space to listen to the Spirit of God whispering in our lives. But it's not the only time. It's important and necessary for us to practice solitude with Scripture. If we want to imitate Jesus, we need to build the rhythm into our day to listen to Jesus as well. You know, when I went on that guided, fly, that guided fly fishing trip, it would have been really foolish of me to take the guide fishing and then completely ignore everything that Landon gave me. All the instructions that Landon gave me, I listened to, but it would, be, it would have been silly for me to ignore them. It would have been a wasted opportunity, and I would have missed out on, on the entire experience. What if following Jesus is the same? Where we open our Bibles or attend church, but we just ignored the things the Spirit was guiding us into. And we all know that the voices and demands in this world are loud at times. And it can be easy to push Jesus to the sides and the margins. But what if we intentionally wake up earlier? What if we turned off the TV or the radio and just sat with Jesus and just invited him to speak? I believe when we do that, Jesus begins to meet us there. I think when we do that, Jesus begins to engage in the areas of our lives that maybe create anxiety for us. He begins to, to give wisdom with the relationships that require guidance for us. He begins to refine our character to look like his. When we practice solitude with Scripture, we begin to create space that allows us to examine our own lives in the areas that we need to refine so that we can be more like Jesus, so that we can continue to to imitate Jesus so that we can accomplish and fulfill his global mission on earth. The more we allow Jesus to guide our lives, the more we imitate Jesus. The more we imitate Jesus, the more our lives are rooted in love. The more our lives are rooted in love, the more our relationships are filled with love too. This summer, maybe you know that there are times that your love tank may be stretched or drained. Or maybe this has been a, a, just a really tiring season for you and your love tank is completely drained and you're riding on fumes. Maybe it's just time to stop. Just allow Jesus to fill your love tank up so that you can begin to move forward again. So that you can allow the love in you to work itself out in your relationships as you imitate Jesus. This morning as we celebrate Christ's sacrifice for us through communion. We recognize that the bread and juice are just symbols to represent Christ's blood poured out to us and his body given to us as he established a new covenant, a new way to associate and interact with God. Communion reminds us that we are called to walk in the path that Jesus has laid out for us. It becomes a way for us to examine our own hearts and lives and invite Jesus into the relationships that might need to be reconciled. It becomes a way to examine our own hearts and lives and invite Jesus to have a more active role in our lives. Maybe we have been trying, maybe we've been trying to create our own path and we've just been doing our own thing. We're just doing things that Jesus hasn't called us into. Ultimately, what communion does though is it serves as a reminder that Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for us through his death on the cross, showing us what true love looks like, showing us that true love is filled with sacrifice and that through Jesus, we have the opportunity to experience the fullness and richness of, the, of that love in our lives, that it is not, we don't have to live in that tainted love any longer. The bread representing Jesus' body given for us to overcome the sins of the world, died so that we would know him personally and intimately. Take and eat.
the juice, untainted, holy, sinless, and without blemish, poured out so that you would know love in its purest form. Take and drink. Maybe today God has been speaking to you. Maybe in the area of your own sexual purity. I would invite you to talk to someone about that. If you want to send me an email or call me, I think we're going to have the, my email and phone number on this video. You can click on the link if you're, on, if you're part of our online service for live prayer. You need to know I'm certainly no expert in this area, but I've had my own challenges in this area too. And Satan will try to tell you that you are alone on this. And you aren't. Maybe though for some of you, God is moving in your heart in a different way. And you just need someone to process that with. You need someone to talk about it with. I'd like to invite you to reach out to. And you can click on that live prayer button on the online church app or or you can, someone would love to pray for you. You can reach out to me. I'd love to pray for you. If you want to talk to someone, someone that you know loves Jesus, talk with them about what's going on. What, what has God been talking to you about? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are, for the depths of your love for us, that you model for us a love that, that transcends all boundaries, that you set us free from this tainted love, that you help us to know that there is an alternative way to live, there's a lifestyle that we can choose that, that it is rooted in you, Christ. Help us to walk in that and know the goodness of it, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.